Great. Um, and as I've said, uh, I will introduce everyone when I ask the first question. And um, we will start with our colleagues from the so-called Global South. I do not like this, uh, this word, uh, this concept very much. At least one of us, as we found out, is really from the South. This is Andre <laughs> from South Africa. But nevertheless, we will start with GT, Mr. Tiwari, as we can call him, he said us, because his first name is a little bit too difficult <laughs> for Europeans. And I would like, he is a politician, an opposition politician in India, and he is an entrepreneur, which is also very important in the education sector. And GT, I would like to ask you, how much for a country, how much is the transatlantic dialogue, the transatlantic relationship important for a country like India, a rising power, the greatest country in the world by population, or isn't it of any interest for you? Good afternoon. Thank you for this uh, fantastic uh, forum, as well as uh, the enriching discussions that have happened. Um, I must admit that when I learned about the topic, I had to Google what Global South is. And <laughs> so to give you an Indian perspective, um, this is the first uh, few days in this month that I haven't heard anybody speaking about Indian elections, uh, which start any time uh, from now. Uh, there are going to be a billion voters voting in the <coughs> Indian election. And if democracy was a continent, then one can imagine, and as we discuss about uh, freedom of speech, the way uh, democracy is at risk, we need to look at, in that continent of democracy, who are the citizens of, of this democracy? What is their value system? How are they getting impacted, if not with the idea of transatlantic, but what is happening in the uh, nations in transatlantic, what would happen in the US election, what's the kind of dialogue that will emerge, how technology, AI will shape that election, the European Union, the tensions in uh, Russia, Ukraine, the confusing voices emerging from the transatlantic with respect to Israel-Gaza uh, war that is uh, very, very tragic. So from the Indian perspective, we have a nation which is very large going to, going to vote. Um, any number you take on India is a very large number. 1.2 billion users of mobile phones, 600 million users of smartphones. Uh, nearly 40% of all transactions are digital now. Um, 300 million users use digital payments. Uh, around 50 million businesses, small businesses, use digital payments for some uh, numbers as low as 10 cents or even 5 cents. So that is the, the geography that uh, India is as part of this, this global south. And for us, what is very important is that as we look at, at mature democracies, what is the value system that exists between these two uh, transatlantic and global south? Um, when you look at press freedom, how is it reflected in a mature democracy to be able to push press freedom in India? When you look at, at uh, labor force participation for women or leadership for women, how is it reflected in transatlantic to be able to push a case for India? So at one level, transatlantic matters because uh, you are looking at values that you want to see progress in your own dem uh, democracy. At another level, there is a need from transatlantic to recognize that there is a vibrant democracy that is building up that has uh, these huge numbers. For example, um, there are around 400 to 420 million Indians which, who are under age of 14. So if you have to look at the stakeholder of the new world, um, India is a place to, to look at. So it's a, it's a dialogue between the value system, and it is based on that we would know um, how the transatlantic relationship will emerge, which is slightly different from a tech and technology dialogue alone. Thank you very much. Next, Valeria, you have a radio show on a daily basis in Mexico. How often do you discuss transatlantic stuff there? <laughs> and <laughs> the USA and Europe, mainly Europe. Well, thank you, Sasha, and thank you for the invitation to join you here. I might say never. <laughs> no, I mean, I talk about economics, so when I talk about Europe, it's not about Europe as a whole. I talk about what happened, you know, with the exchange rate or what happened with the uh, interest rate in the UK or what happened with inflation, but a very specific 
points. We usually don't talk about Europe as a whole, and the differences maybe, and we were discussing this idea of the global south. This is my third time in Germany for the past, I don't know, maybe eight months. And the first time I heard Global South was here. Mm -hmm. And I didn't Google it, but I asked it, like, what are you talking about? What's the Global South? Because, and they talked to me, in, I'm Mexican, they talked to me as if I were from the Global South. And it's like, well, Mexico is in the northern part of the <laughs> hemisphere. I don't understand what you're talking about when you say Global South. Of course, now I get what you mean by Global South. And the difference maybe is that when you talk about Global South, you take a whole bunch of different countries and mix them up yep. and talk about the same values or the same ideas. And for me, that's so strange because we're, I mean, you consider Mexico and India and South Africa maybe in the global south. I can't think of more different countries maybe. Um, and when I talk about Europe, I don't talk about Europe as a whole. I usually pinpoint mm -hmm. different countries or specific countries. So the idea of you know, splitting the world into east, west, uh, north, south, I think uh, maybe, of course, it simplifies our vision of the world, but it's not real. Uh, even when we talk in Mexico about Europe, it's very different if we talk about Spain or the UK or, or mm -hmm. the UK. Last time I was here, I asked something to the security guard in the hotel, and he told me like very keenly, the UK is not in Europe. I was like, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so even that we can't agree upon. So things are much more complex, and what we are seeing within the values <laughs> and the democracies that are part of these different regions are so different. I was listening to the previous panels and they were talking about the OECD and the, the vision of shared values in these 38 countries. And suddenly they, uh, she started talking about the countries that were aiming to join the, the OECD and Argentina and Peru. And I was like, oh, are they democracies? I, I, and it's just a question. You know, it's like, it's just a question. And sometimes we try to bundle things together in order to try to explain ourselves, mm. those countries or those different values. And we're oversimplifying the issues. Uh, I think reality is much more complex than that. Okay, thank you very much. Andres, you are the only person on the panel, the really south. from the south. <laughs> <laughs> from the, from the new south. What's your, your perspective on, on this discussion? Because we, we all also discuss Africa as a whole here in... Um, <laughs> <laughs> here in uh, Germany and in Europe, also as a whole and as something which has to be helped by us somehow. Is this a perspective you like? <laughs> thank you, and thank you also for the invitation. It's a privilege of being here. And yes, uh, it's interesting to listen uh, to my co-panelists here. And now I have to put a caveat in the because I'm from the South African Embassy, I think I must be a little bit more measured. Um, so yes, indeed, I'm from the South, but it indeed also links, give us to try and respond to your question. Uh, from my surname, you will deduct that I actually, my great-great-great-grandfather came from the Netherlands, went down to South Africa. I think it was around, uh, around about 1790, 1786 or something around. I wasn't there. Uh, it's alleged that it was at that time. Um, so, and I also served, served in New York uh, at our permanent mission there, and there I was privileged for the first time ever when South Africa chaired the grouping that we called the G77th and China. Uh, and when the group was created, uh, roughly around the year that I was born, which I'm not going to say that now, but um, the, when it originated, it was to give countries of the South uh, that's got a, a specific developmental path and specifically also a post-colonial or at that time it was being part of the post-colonial era to give them a voice. Um, so serving in New York, I had the privilege then of South Africa's uh, chairing the first time 
uh, the G77 and China, where you will then negotiate with the global north or Europe. And yes, Mexico was not, is not part of the G77, um, but uh, we did have good relations. Uh, apart from bilateral relations, Mexico was, was a good sounding board. The point I'm trying to get at is, indeed, it is not as an easy geographical uh, distinction to be made. Uh, there are lots of differences. South Africa is part of BRICS, as you would know now, the BRICS Plus. Uh, South Africa is also the only African country that's part of the G20. Um, South Africa is obviously part of the African Union. Um, and yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. I even had it myself when people come to me and say, they hear I'm from South Africa, and do I know his friend who's from Nigeria? So, you know, <laughs> I said, yes, and that's just next door. Uh, see them every weekend. Um, so I understand that that uh, 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 is, is sometimes a bit confusing, but ultimately what it's about, uh, and getting back to your first part of the question um, in terms of the transatlantic, how does it influence the South? Um, for us in South Africa, we've got an open trading system at, at, at one, and as you can see, because we're part of the G20, part of BRICS, um, served on the Security Council three times now, uh, we see ourselves as being part of the global uh, community in which you would like to Explain what you asked about. Do we speak en enough about the, uh, the global south? Um, do we understand the global south? And I mean, I can only speak for South Africa as much as I said, we're part of that and, and we're proud of being part of the global south. Um, south Africa would want to see a global community that is more responsive to the needs um, of the uh, and aspirations. I'm actually glad that you mentioned that you said that it's something that you have to give to. Uh, that you so sometimes have to help. And, and um, so, we, yes, we have our own developmental challenges, absolutely. And we're so grateful for, amongst other, my current host, Germany, for uh, the good cooperation that we have on various fronts. Um, but I think South Africa and the Global South has lots to share. Um, you know, I think uh, not only about, um, please do try our South African wine, so it's not only about South African wine and the beautiful beaches that we have, but we would like to see uh, uh, being part of a global community where the aspirations and dreams of uh, more than uh, my colleague from, from India has uh, uh, correctly said about the number of people living in India, but if you look at the global south uh, and the BRICS plus for that matter, you're looking close to 50% of the global uh, population. So we think we have an input to make to help all of us uh, so that our children in the future could live in a world of peace, security, and freedom. Thank you very much. Güde, you are a member of parliament and even a leading member of parliament as a deputy chairperson of the parliamentary group of FTP. What can Germany and what can the European Union do to improve the dialogue and to improve the economic and political relations with the global south. Are we, shall we do something alone as Germany or shall we act only as part of the European Union or as part of the bigger thing, the, the West, the transatlantic partnership? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you uh, for inviting me. Thank you also for the perspectives uh, that have been maybe from an Indian and uh, Mexican and the South African perspective. Um, I'm from the very north of Germany and even the south of Germany is different to the north. <laughs> and um, in, in the light of that very broad question, I would like to um, maybe uh, pinpoint certain things I think we could do on a parliamentary, from a parliamentary perspective, but also from a um, let's call it from a human perspective, yeah, what, yeah. what could be done. Um, I think that um, also post-COVID, we should be traveling more as parliamentarians mm -hmm. and not just to countries that we used to travel to. Um, I was um, um, chairwoman of the um, Committee on Human Rights and Humanitarian Aid in the past legislative term. And we also we were one of the one of the only committees that actually travel to countries um, that are maybe a little bit aside from the mm. 
obvious agenda um, um, countries um, the, the Bundestag has exchanges with. So I would say um, that should be done more. And if we are there in countries that maybe fit the frame of the Global South, I don't like the frame yeah. either, um, we should be listening more. We should not be patronizing so much. And I think from a p parliamentary perspective, what comes to my mind, um, I, I have been to South Africa, I haven't been to Mexico, I haven't been to India yet. Um, so um, we need to listen in order to understand that there are always different perspectives, not from the global south. Um, and so there will always be a German perspective on things, but Germany, I think should always be urged to put it into a European perspective mm -hmm. and maybe on, on a broader sense um, to a uh, democratic perspective. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, in these times, I think it is about uh, the concept of democracies sticking together, not sharing every single point of view, but sharing the perspective um, against the concept of autocracy and yeah. what is at stake at the moment. And maybe um, a very last point, um, it's not only about parliamentarians and politicians exchanging views, but also about people exchanging views. And as I'm also dealing with um, education in, in, um, in my current position, um, I think we should um, promote projects that um, people, students come together and um, India is um, one very good example where um, people from the educational perspective should look towards mm -hmm. because um, I think Indians do the same, but we have to counter that, um, that uh, narrative that we need to be interested in what India thinks, what Indian students also Many want things. for their future. And the same is true for Mexico or for South Africa and um, countries where we need to have language skills, perspective, what is happening from their point of view. And I think we should promote that also on a political level. Thank you very much. Jürgen, you have a long professional experience in, in politics, in policies, in global organizations. What can be done from your perspective on this level, on the level of global organizations, international multilateral organizations, because one of the arguments, for example, the BRICS countries always bring forward is that they do not have enough influence there. They would like to have more influence at the IMF, World Bank, and, and so on. What's your take on that? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, I mean, there is the word in, uh, in, in, in the room, Germany is punching below its weight. Mm -hmm. This was the result of the uh, OECD review. I think that's what many resent. And um, in a way, I think we improved, uh, but um, still I think uh, it's uh, partly true. And I was struggling my whole life with that. Uh, what to do to better engage? It's not about, you know, striking on the table and no or yes or whatever. It's about engaging. It's about bringing ideas into an international dialogue. And I think there we still have problems. Uh, it's partly historical. It's partly our focus on ec economic competitiveness and export competitiveness. Um, it's about our federal uh, structure. Um, and of course, a part of the problem is the European Union, where we could have more weight um, but uh, still, we didn't see the Hamiltonian moment where more competences are given to, to Brussels, in particular in the fiscal space. For example, I, I was um, executive director at the World Bank. Europe aggregate has 32% of shares and, and, and voting shares in, in the World Bank. Yeah. The US has between 16 and 70. The US, you know, when the US raises uh, the voice, everybody is listening in the manager. When Europe is raising the voice, it's like, pfft, what do they mean? <laughs> and therefore, we try to bring it together. But we have to, if we want 
to play a more important and positive role, we have to look at those issues. You know, it's important to travel and to engage, of course, but we have to look at those hard issues. Yeah? And it doesn't come without trade-offs. And there are many ideas we could uh, launch then. For example, one I personally launched in the World Bank, and now the government uh, is, is so much behind this, is the reform of the multilateral development banks. And I think it's in the interest of Germany that we better prepare for crisis, we prevent crisis. So our interest is to uh, bring development and crisis prevention, global public goods together. That's our interest. And you have to change the, the multilateral landscape if you want to do that. And that's what we tried to do. And it was a good start. But I think we have to have more of those uh, initiatives. And we have to be aware that all the problems we have here in Germany, which are so dear to us, which are so important to us, climate change, loss of biodiversity, fragility all over the place, they are closely linked with development. Even, you know, poor countries, I do not talk about the, uh, the Chinas or so, the, the higher middle income countries, poor countries will emission two-fifths of uh, greenhouse gases in 2030. So we have to look at those uh, countries in all those issues, global health, biodiversity, um, uh, and, uh, and climate and other. Thank you very much. Next, Nicolas, you wrote a book about six phases of globalization. And you asked who wins and who loses, and give some answers on it. But, but what can we do that everyone or every country wins and almost no one loses? Well, the problem is that there are six different views, at least, <laughs> <laughs> on, that, on that question. What I just want to talk a little bit about the background to the book. When I was studying in the early 2000s, the main critiques of globalization came from the global south. They came from India, from, from other developing countries who saw the, the multilateral institutions as a continuation of, of, of essentially a neo-colonial project. And then in 2015, 2016, something really interesting happened, that the West, who had created uh, many of these institutions, who ha had been the main promoter of, of globalization, suddenly turned on its own creation. And, and you had all these different critiques emerging of globalization from the right, from the left, from the environment movement, from the security sphere of, of globalization in the West. And what's really interesting about that, that it totally scrambled uh, the debate. Um, and, and suddenly we had, for example, in 2017, we had uh, Xi Jinping in Davos, styling himself the defender of, of neoliberal globalization and, and, and the West um, being, being in retreat. And what's, what's really interesting to see in looking at the different narratives, the different critiques of globalization, is that there are many parallels in, 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 in the global south and in the global north. We have um, boosts of globalization, especially among the elites in the, in, in the, in the global south, that the same that we have in the established parties in, uh, in the West. We also have critics on the right and the left. But then there's some narratives where we have mirror images. Um, so for example, the Trump narrative the, about the decline of manufacturing, it's mirrored in Asia by an, a narrative about the rise of Asia, right? Or this geoeconomic security-focused narrative that we have now emerging, particularly in the United States, but also in Europe, it's mirrored in, in Russia and China by a concern about Western hegemony, right? So these security arguments are mostly seen um, as a pretext for protectionism or an yes. attempt to, 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 keep, um, to keep the non-Western countries that are rising down or, or out. And there's a, a strong perception of hypocrisy on the part of the West. This idea that the West wrote the rules and as long as they serve the West well, we, we, we ask everyone to obey them and the moment they don't serve us anymore, uh, we, we, we step back from the rules. So, so the debate has been scrambled, and we see that very clearly also in institutions like the World Trade Organization. We, all, we tend to think of the West uh, as somehow opposed to China, but when we look at debates, for example, around the dispute settlement uh, system in the World Trade Organization, 
it's really the EU and China on the same side and the US is on the other side, right? So the EU and China are trying to protect the system or reform the system as it was, and it's the US that's saying this no longer works for us. And so we have to be very careful um, when we look at the lawmaking process, for example, India often stands against China and other developing countries, right? So it's, it's a very scrambled picture, very different views about what the benefits and, um, and of globalization are, and they don't necessarily align with the global north, global south uh, dividing line. Okay, thank you. One more question from my side uh, before we go to the audience. Um, we've talked a little bit about international organizations as well. That's it, WTO, IMF, World Bank, and so on. GT, are those organizations still important for India and for other countries? I will have the same question for you. Or are you looking more for alternative organizations, like, for example, in the framework of BRICS or other regional projects? What do you think? Is w, does the WTO, does the IMF, do all those organizations have a future, a good future? I think one can have where we stand uh, today in the world. One can have a gloomy view of what is happening with, with various elections and wars, but I have a fairly hopeful view. I think that uh, if we think of a future first vision for the world. It's important to let go of the, the past first vision and the nomenclatures of the past and the organizations that came from that. <coughs> future first vision would look at aspirations of youth. It will look at uh, the income mobility of poor and middle, not necessarily poor and middle income countries, but, but people who are in poor and middle income classes. It will look at the, uh, the uh, rise in values such as diversity, inclusion, uh, freedom of expression, press. When I look at uh, European Union, uh, I visited Brussels in 2014 as a EU VP invitee, and it was surprising to see uh, united in diversity as one of the, the themes at the European Union. Um, growing up in India, we grew up with the slogan that unity in diversity. So at some time, uh, we are at a stage, if we took a look at a future first vision, there are a lot of common themes that are emerging. Um, it would definitely require establishment of peace, and as a result, one has to be critical of the organizations that have existed in the past have, and have not been successful in at least articulating an agenda for peace in the current situation where war is going on, and even putting uh, both perspectives on table. So to your question, I think it is important that in a world where the global south, even if we adjust to that term, uh, is not a knowledge-scarce world. Now, with technology, knowledge is available uh, everywhere. It's also not a, a world which has a different value system when, when we look at democratic countries in the global south. It's the same value system that Transatlantic is talking about. It's also a, a, a space where the aspirations of the youth cannot be fulfilled without proper trade uh, agreements, uh, because there is consumer everywhere, and the consumer wants the best that the money can buy. Uh, it's a place where tech, everybody is looking at technology as a way to progress better in education. Um, you will be able to achieve education of a future generation at a, a fraction of the cost with digital content and other things. Um, with the fintech and, and uh, digital money, it's easy to distribute benefits. Corruption goes down. Clearly, India has a number of examples to show. With digital health, the access to knowledge, both uh, in this particular case, uh, countries like India would be a supplier of human capital in healthcare and knowledge in, in, in healthcare. We have seen in the COVID times that how India has led the provision of vac vaccine to the world. And today, if you look at the WTO vaccines, 70% of, if my numbers are not wrong, 70% of vaccines by WTO come from India. So I think the world is changing, and we have to build, think about, creatively think about the building blocks with a future first vision rather than a, a rear view in sight. Thank you, GT. Valeria, you are, how do you, how's your take on, on the WTO? Or is everything regional much more important for your country, especially in your 
situation. As, GT was, as GT was saying, the, the world is changing. And yeah. what I see from these organizations, WTO or the World Bank or the IFC or the OECD, mm -hmm. is that there are great sources of information. They're amazing in order to produce information. And we all use the information they produce. But they are very slow to adapt. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that the world is moving at a rate. Technology is moving at a rate. Innovation is moving at a different rate. And then the World Bank reacts or there the OECD says something. Or, so they're very, as every institution that becomes too large, they are very slow to adapt. It's like moving very slowly. And economists from the global south, or whatever you want to call them, they're moving faster in a way, in, in different system. ways. Yeah. They're Absolutely. transitioning yeah. differently mm -hmm. than these organizations. I think that regional agreements, such as in the case of Mexico, the USMCA, our trade agreement with Canada and the US, has become much more important, mm -hmm. even for the economic structure and the political structure of the country, than what the World Bank or the IFC or these huge organizations. Our trade agreements are the ones, or our main trade agreement, which is the USMCA, is the, the one that dictates it's kind of, you know, it's, it's even more important than just trade. Because in that agreement, we have a chapter on corruption. In that, in that uh, agreement, we have a chap uh, chapter on SMEs. In that agreement, we have a chapter on gender equality. So it has become the new standard of trade agreements. It has much more included yeah. within the agreement than, quote unquote, just trade. Thank you. And Andres, your take on on this, on trade and global organizations. Thank you very much. Yes, I think <clears throat> I will once again want to raise the point that was made, uh, that kind of came out of the G20 statement in New Delhi last year, in terms of support for the WTO. Um, so South Africa is part of that group that wants to have a multilateral system based on uh, fair and basic rules that respect the inputs of everybody. Um, so for us, the WTO, the IMF, the Bretton Woods institutions, um, the global institutions, uh, we're very uh, supportive of that. As a matter of fact, the last BRICS summit that was held in South Africa, mm -hmm. it was again raised that South Africa and the BRICS uh, participants at that time, it was not the BRICS plus then, but um, were supporting of the UN uh, multilateral go global governance systems. Um, but what I need to just latch on to, to the reference of, of COVID, what is important for, for South Africa, and I think I can speak for the global south as much as we <laughs> difficulty in, 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 in defining it, but what happened during COVID, and my president did make this statement in Paris uh, at, at the conference there, where he was expressing... Um, the challenge that we had during COVID, which was a global, global phenomena. But what happened was that countries of the North had the, value, the, the financial means to buy the vaccines. Mm -hmm. And the Global South did not have the same access to those means. And we really felt like orphans, if you will, uh, addressing a global phenomena that affects everybody. And... Um, from a South African perspective, when our scientists have identified the additional strain that uh, developed during that time, what did countries of the North did? They immediately slapped uh, visa restrictions on South Africa, as if the strain was in South Africa only. It's that type of thing that we want to have at the global level being addressed in a more respectful and a fair uh, uh, approach that will make the world going forward and dealing with these global challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Güde, we just, just heard that the developing countries or many countries, the global south, whatever, is moving sometimes faster than we can, than we can do it in, in Europe or in the global organizations. And my feeling is very often that we are too slow even in small things. For example, like uh, regional trade agreements. I remember the strange story with a trade agreement with Canada and the ratification process. Now we have the Mercosur uh, issue and we have some other trade, trade issues to deal with where we can deal with on a regional level. What, 
what can the Liberal Party do or what can our parliament do to, to speed up the process in a Europe where trade is decided at Brussels and not primarily at, at, uh, in Berlin? Well, still, we, we need to prepare to yeah. make Brussels be prepared for the actual voting mm. and preparedness process. But, um, yeah, I think we need to be faster. I think it is not so much... Um, well, within the Liberal Party, you do not find many people who are not in favor of yeah. more free trade. Um, I think sometimes it is um, the, uh, the way that... Um, also this coalition looks towards free trade and sometimes there is not a one-size-fits-all mm. framework and sometimes I think we could be faster if we would focus on the actual free trade um, agreement and not so much adding yeah. more and more yeah. to the free trade agreement that then gets an overload on certain mm. other things that are all important, don't get me wrong, um, and so far, I just talked to a colleague yesterday um, with regard to Mercosur and where we are at the moment, because it's not on my, um, on my um, 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 on table at the moment. But he said, Germany is actually done with the process. Yeah. We have been doing everything we could, and now it is Brussels' turn. And it's Paris, um, and Paris, and, <laughs> and, and, and Paris' turn, actually, yeah. But... Um, if you ask us as free democrats, there should be more free trade in order also to, and with all consequences, also for German or European companies, if that means that uh, companies from, well, from the global south, from other countries, uh, could um, get easier market access here, um, that should be a good consequence and good side effects because we are more intertwined um, and that actually brings more strength, I think, to the whole world economy. And that's what we can shape. And that's what we'd like to do more. Thank you very much. Before I open the questions to the audience, Jürgen, you wanted to, to comment on that a little bit? Yeah, I can. <laughs> I mean, one thing is the European Union, again. Um, because I think the question in the room is also... Um, strengthen U.S. European German relationship, but I think the U.S. would love to see a stronger actor in Europe. Doesn't want to see, you know, <coughs> 27 voices which are not aligned very often. So I think we have to get that act together. The second point is multilateral institutions are important. I mean, when you look at all those challenges, I mean, there is no alternative uh, to, to that. What, what shall we do? I mean, just let it go. The question is more uh, the governance of these, um, of these multilateral institutions. And uh, there, my experience at the World Bank, it's quite good. You know, we had, for example, with my Chinese uh, colleague, uh, when we had tough disputes in the board. Afterwards, we went down in the, in the executive dining room. We had um, lunch together, and he was explaining to me what the landscape in Beijing is looking like. You know, there's this actor, that actor, and, and we tried to find solutions uh, to accommodate the different. That's what we need. But we still can uh, improve. And I think a very important institution is the G20. People said uh, with Russia, now the G20 is dead. The G7, I mean, is important, but it's not a global uh, yeah. institution. We need something like the, the G20, and very often, if we have a problem in the multilateral institutions, the G20 has to take a kind of position, and then it deblocks uh, the negotiations in those institutions. I think it's difficult, um, but uh, that's, uh, that's the situation. Uh, and I think we, we have to face it. And um, there are solutions out there. I could t t give you some 10 possible initiatives yeah. we, we could take. You don't want me to do that. <laughs> Not at the moment. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Yes, please. Just a very quick comment. I just found it so striking to hear what you just said, that we want more free trade. And yesterday we had in the very same chair your colleague uh, from, from, from the Greens, Mr. Audredge, saying exactly the opposite. He was saying, we need the jobs here, we need the steel jobs here, the car jobs here. So, and that's the fundamental paradigm shift that has happened over the past, uh, over the past couple of years, that, that we moved from the, yours was absolutely the majority view to a, a view where in the US and in many parts of the government, um, your colleague, Mr. Aldridge's view is the majority view. And this fundamental paradigm shift, I think we have to be conscious of. It's, it, there's simply um, the way the Western governments think about global trade is no longer liberalization is, is great. They're much more consciously thinking about what um, is the global division of labor that we want. And the reason for that is China. So there's really a time before China when we could say, well, let's have free trade, let's compete. China has made this big jump uh, to, to, to the top of value chains, and now the West has second thoughts and really thinks, okay, now we have to intervene much more actively in, uh, in global value chains or in, in supply chains and make sure that we still get our piece of the pie. Agreed directly. Yeah, just, just a quick note on, on, on China. I think the problem is that if we, if we apply the concept of free trade, um, it is not pick and choose by China, it, free trade also follows rules and has a set of rules. And I think the, the, the challenge with negotiating with China, um, everybody maybe has very own perspectives when it comes to that, um, is that they, uh, not they, China always tries to um, get the best out of a deal, but only from the Chinese perspective. and. I think when we talk about free trade, uh, we, we need to have our interests set up first and then pay attention towards the perspective of China if we, if we negotiate and that our green coalition partners have a different view on how free trade should be organized in the future is maybe one part of the, the answer to why it's taking so long sometimes. And I'm very happy that we are where we are with Mercosur. Um, but uh, Chancellor Merkel, for example, um, had um, the deal towards the, um, the Tsai, uh, the, the uh, comprehensive agreement on investment with China on the European level. Basically, she had it all prepared and it needed a European Parliament's perspective and the way China dealt with with international law to to take that back. So German perspective is very, very uh, broad on in in a sense. Where where do we have to sign when it comes to? Um, I, I I'm missing the point. I just wanted to make a quick notice. But I think um, negotiating with China on a free trade level is basically not possible at the moment. But we should not apply that on every other country where these trade agreements need to be possible in the future. Thank you very much. Now, now I would like to open the floor for debates. We have two. Uh, you've been the first, probably, uh, in the last. Oh, yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, Victor Vox from INSM. A question to Mr. Lamp. You talked about uh, European hypocrisy and you described sort of a shift where you said China and Europe are defending one model when the United States is actually defending the opposite one. Can you explain that a bit further, what that means for the future? And also um, tying in with what Ms. Jensen said in terms of getting an okay from Paris and Brussels for further agreements. Um, what's, what your take is on strategy in that respect. Thank you. Because we have only 10 minutes left, as I understand, or 11 or something, we take some questions and then ask you, because Henning Kumba is, is next, please. And then the we go to the other half over there, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Henning Krumrei, advisor for politics and economics. I remember the last visit of uh, Brazilian's President Lula uh, in Berlin, and he complained about the negotiations for the Mercosur agreement, and he said he, was, uh, he is tired of uh, European governments as well as NGOs that they tell uh, Brazil what is good 
for <laughs> Brazil. So are we witnessing a new kind of, let's say, ecological and social imperialism? What's your take on that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we take the, the other ones. Was there? Two gentlemen in last, yes. Hi, uh, Tashar Shetty uh, for The Diplomat magazine in Washington, D.C. Yeah, uh, my question is, um, I think a lot of the panelists from the Global South have talked about a greater need to understand the perspectives and the aspirations of the people from their countries. And this um, organization, as well as some organizations have attended, like Atlantic Puka, have a multi-tiered stakeholder interaction between, let's say, Germany and the US. It's not just trade or development talks. It's also politicians, bureaucrats, industry associations, NGOs, et cetera. My question to those who are more familiar with the German side of things are, does that exist with Germany and countries in the global south, that multi-tiered stakeholder approach to understand each other's issues? And is there a strategy to increase that with certain countries or certain areas in the future? Thank you. Okay. That's it for Chris? Yeah. Let's split up. Okay, then we have a set of questions, quite different complexes. First, what we can do to convince Brussels and, and, and Paris and so on uh, to push forward a little bit with free trade, so on. And then we have this c complex of questions about something like value imperialism and so. And if you know the ambassador of Brazil here in Germany, he uses those words. If he would be on this panel, he would say it. And finally, how can we strengthen, maintain dialogue between our sort of different countries? Um, yeah, who should answer first? <laughs> Probably we start with a politician, right? Okay. Well, what can Germany really do to push for more? for more free trade uh, in the European Union towards Brussels, towards Paris, uh, and other countries. Is there even a chance to do something on the European level? Um, as I talked too much beforehand, I'd <laughs> like to just um, say a very few words. I, I think we should not be gold plating all yeah. the time. Yeah. We shouldn't be overloading every single contract that we negotiate with everything there yeah. is on the table. That's why we have different, um, different contracts and different ministries and perspectives. And um, with regard to the, the dialogue question and maybe the exchange uh, uh, question, I'm not aware if, um, of any kind of exchange framework that fits the frame as the transatlantic uh, framework or, or um, um, exchange uh, systems, young leader programs. But I think there is developing, um, um, there is a development into the right direction, but that's also, um, it goes both ways. So if there's no interest um, from uh, one side, it is very difficult to ex to exchange or to establish these uh, roadmaps. But um, there are certain young leader programs. There's a lot of um, um, a lot of um, intensified talk, also with unique young leaders. Um, that uh, the whole world is basically uh, in these programs, and not just U.S. Americans or or and and and. Um, Europe-based politicians, and I think that's the right way we should lead it. Thank you. Uh, GT, Valeria, and Andres, your political elites have the feeling that the global north or the transatlantic uh, partners teach you too much and do not enough? Well, I think that uh, value imperialism would be a strong term from past, but if we uh, look at a future first vision. Uh, there are some good lessons that uh, exist from the transatlantic world. Uh, the various indices, which are, which are uh, democracy, uh, freedom of press, uh, the uh, participation of women in, in labor force. The world has progressed, especially the democratic world, to be able to look at another democratic country through diff different indices. That's a good place uh, to start a d discussion on values. However, when we look at values from a vision towards future, what is, uh, I'll, I can tell for India, 
One way India discovers how the world is looking at it is, India has extensive diaspora across the world. Uh, students who studied in different parts of the world, um, to give you a sense, in a couple of years, 10 million students from India will study in different universities across the world. Now, that is how they will understand the value system of the world vis-a-vis -vis India. And as a result, it will be a dialogue, not necessarily uh, a point of judgment by the West uh, of India. Um, similarly, uh, when we look at technology, as I said, that a lot of technology is getting integrated in the way of life uh, in, uh, for a young Indian. And in that, as AI comes in, a challenge that any democracy will face is how do we as citizens find out what truth is? Because uh, an AI-based system, a big tech-driven ecosystem, can manipulate and create different versions of truth. And that's a challenge that a Western democracy will face. That's a challenge that an Indian democracy will face. And any value-based system will look at which democracy is able to navigate that better, maybe because of, of uh, regulation, or it is because better digital literacy of the people. Uh, so I think the, the next is innovation. And again, uh, sure, final point. Uh, with innovation, again, a number of these uh, judgment systems will change. So with that, I don't think that uh, today uh, there is a frame that uh, West can monopolize on value systems for other democracies. It's an evolving dialogue. Thank you very much. We are running a little bit out of time, but Valeria. Very quickly. Please, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that imperialism is the way to think about it. I think that we're, and you are, in a different stage of development. So in that way, and if we understand it like that, we can see what advantages or what things you've done right and what mistakes we can avoid. If we can talk each other to each other, we shouldn't be talking about imperialism, but about cooperation. <laughs> OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I'll also be short. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just very quickly, I mean, South Africa's democracy is relatively new since 1994, and our constitution has definitely got elements that we learned from the North. Uh, as much as it's a homegrown um, document that uh, South Africans developed. But I want to just quickly say two things. South Africa um, is, in terms of both being spoken to or speak with. That's why we're happy to be part of the G20. And secondly, we're very happy that the African Union is now part of the G20 as well. So we have the elements of, of uh, that engagement. And lastly, South Africa is, as far as I know, the only African country on the continent that has a strategic partnership with the European Union. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then we obviously have many parliamentarians going to South Africa and coming here. So I think there's a lot of elements that we talk to, to uh, that we have the opportunity to have, that we can talk to one another. But I think ultimately we as human beings um, are just that, we are human beings. We sometimes forget that we've got two ears and one mouth. So we would listen more and talk less. Yeah. So, Nicolas and Jürgen, you have the final words, both very briefly. Just one question. Go forward one year in your imagination. We have a lot of elections coming forward in most of our respective countries in the European Union. What do you think? Uh, we are a step moving forward. We stepped forward a little bit towards a, a better world. Um, a free trade world, an open world, or will there be stagnation? What's your estimate from both of you? Is possible. I think the danger is not so much stagnation, but open conflict. Uh, yeah. And and the the step, to, one step we can take to prevent that is to listen to the other side. So we we mm -hmm. tend to talk about China, we tend to talk about our concerns about security, but we don't listen to how those that is perceived in China. I mean, China has created this global champion Huawei, right? And instead of letting it flourish, uh, we are trying to keep it down um, at every step. And so if we don't, and that's, I think, the sense of hypocrisy that, um, that, that is sometimes felt in, 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 in China and in other countries, that, that when uh, we play, apply one set of rules to ourselves, uh, we laud capitalism and freedom, and then once somebody else succeeds, um, in this case, a Chinese company, we, we keep it down. And, and it's, this is not to say that the security concerns are not legitimate, but if you're not aware of the, how it looks from the other side, we are really in danger of sleepwalking into, into, into a conflict. Thank you. Jürgen, you have the yes, final Yes, I think word. when you look at trade and investment, uh, one can see some, you know, restructuring, not revolutionary, 
but um, also on the backdrop of the global transformation, I think there are many opportunities for developing countries emerging, including mm -hmm. Africa, for example, in the commodity area. Yeah and uh, the supply chain restructuring, I mean, moving away from China and so on. I think that's really interesting to, to look at. But, and, and with regard to the question, um, more freer trade and the, the negotiations we have, I mean, <laughs> we are living in democracies and we have our political economy. I mean, you can wish something, but it always has to go to, through the political systems. And, for me, an important point is uh, when we work on standards or on trade um, uh, uh, agreements, we have to bring our partners in the global south with us. Um, we have to, to find possibilities, you know, not to exclude them, but to, to give them a place in that new world. And for example, uh, there is uh, the, the CBAM, uh, the, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. It's important, I mean, we have to do something like that in Europe, but we have to help those countries. South Africa, for example, we had then, uh, the, the dialogue with South Africa on that. The Chet Peace, the Just Energy Transition Partnerships. The North comes together to work with South Africa in the energy transition. I think these are approaches we, we have to pursue. Thank you very much to all panelists. Thank you for keeping it short and very precise and very, still very interesting. And there are a lot of discussions we need to do, a lot of things we have to discuss in the future. And I think this was a great input, a starting point for conversation. Thank you very much to all Thank of you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, ah, and we do a picture together in the middle here. Yes, please, everyone stay on the stage, and this gentleman will now <laughs> do a picture. So since we are already a little bit over time, but this was such an amazing panel and so interesting, um, we are now just uh, quickly changing the waters up here and making the stage ready for our next panel, which I'm also very excited about. So before all of you come up here, why don't you first take, take a seat um, if you find a little spot over there. Um, and uh, just to answer this one question which was asked, if there are also any kind of multi-stakeholder dialogues, as we do in the transatlantic sphere, um, bringing in the global...